past is to deny the gift of teaching in the church and sometimes borders on blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. We are not here to recreate the kingdom or reinvent it really. But in many cases, we are here to recover some things that the church has lost. When my father wanted to tell us who we were, he got out the family album. I want to share some of the photos in the family album. My first comes from a letter, a letter which is written about the year 110. It's the story of Ignatius of Antioch. Antioch was the great mission church, and Ignatius was a pastor. And he was taken prisoner. And in the company of guards each night in prison, imprisonment, he wrote letters back home and letters to Christians to encourage them. One of those letters, when he got to the city of Smyrna, was written to the chief pastor of Ephesus, the great city church. The city church of Timothy and John. And guess who was the pastor of the church? None other than Onesimus of the Philemon story in the New Testament. You can check this out. The best of Catholic and scholarship, uh, Protestant scholarship agree on this. A slave who stole money in Asia and had run away to Rome to get lost in the urban crowd had found Christ through the reach out of the apostles while Paul was under house arrest. He'd become a believer and was discipled and Paul wrote a little 330 word letter in Greek and sent him back to Laodicea and Colossae where he was discipled and became part of an integrated slave master house church. And sometime later, 14 years after the last living apostle was banished from his pulpit in the same city, a pulpit seeking committee chose an international refugee to be the pastor of the great church in Ephesus. It reminds me in a climate of Proposition 187 and the fear of Americans that were being overtaken by the world. The browning of America, they called it in Time magazine. That the Lord is bringing the whole world to the Londons, to the Parises, and to the Los Angeles, New York, Chicago's of our time. That's the Lord's business. It's the greatest migration in human history. But this early portrait, this wonderful photograph, shows how even in the New Testament, the gospel began in Ephesus with Paul, and 60 years later, the chief pastor in the city was an international refugee. A very important photograph. My second photograph today comes from a letter called Diognetus, written about 140 years after the cross. We're not sure. Somebody suggested Quadratus wrote it. Maybe he did. But if you pick up the book, Library of Christian Classics, Volume 1, and look at this little letter, read particularly chapters 5 and 6, where the writer says, for the Christian, every foreign land is a fatherland, and every fatherland is a foreign land, and Christians dwell in all cities, Greek and pagan alike. And there were only those two in those days. The Christians not only obey the laws of the land, they far exceed them in their character. They share their room and board. On and on he goes. Chapter 6, as the soul is to the body, the Christian is to the city. That's where we get the phrase. Christians are the soul of the city. Diognetus chapter 6, we are the conscience of the city. And chapter 6, verse 10 ends this photograph. To no less a post than this has God ordered them. They dare not try to evade it. Another photograph I got from the late Bishop Samuel in Egypt. 20 years ago or so I was in Egypt doing some studies on churches and hostile cultures, particularly in the Middle East and North Africa, part of a doctoral program. Bishop Samuel died with Anwar Sadat. The president of Egypt was sitting at a parade and was shot by his own soldiers. Bishop Samuel was sitting behind him and was killed in the same burst of bullets. Bishop Samuel told a story I'll never forget. He said, you know how the deacons ministered in Alexandria in the second century? He said, birth control in ancient Greek cities was putting the babies on the porch or on the steps 
The babies that were unwanted were put in the street. Anybody could pick them up. The women deacons, he said, organized to have nursing mothers sit in the plazas of the city square. And then they organized baby hunts to go up and down the streets of Alexandria and collect the unwanted babies. And they brought the babies to the plazas of the nursing mothers. And Bishop Samuel said, that's how the church grew here in Egypt in the second century. What an incredible photograph. E.A. Judge and a number of others have reported that in Judge's monograph from Oxford, Social Patterns of First Century Christian Churches, that most Christians, not all certainly, but most were lower echelon class people. They were artisans, freedmen, and slaves, he said. Many were garbage collectors. And writings in Judge and others, I've learned something about garbage collectors in early Greek cities. You see, they the Greeks and Romans threw the bodies of the dead into the garbage. They had no other alternative. Because if you've read Plato, frankly, bodies aren't worth much. So they tossed them. And the particular bodies that were grotesque were the burn victims of urban fires and the bubonic plague victims of the rat fleas. And those puffy corpses that had turned black and were full of disease were tossed in the garbage. And do you know what the photograph is? The photograph is of Christian garbage collectors collecting the garbage and then taking the bodies that they found in the garbage and bathing them and burying them separately. For even the unjust, they said, would be raised unto judgment. Garbage collectors bathed the bodies they found in the garbage because they knew there was going to be a resurrection. Has any of my theology ever made that kind of difference in the way I work in my city? Here's a photograph of Tertullian of Carthage. We owe him the word Trinity. He recognized that word doesn't occur in the Bible, but three persons are called God. And so in Latin, de Trinitate, he invented the word. He was a lawyer from North Africa. If you put together words from his 37th and 51st apologies, he's thundering at the emperor, and I love what he says. He says, we, meaning Christians, have filled up every place belonging to you. Islands, castles, caves, senate, prison, palace, city, forum. We leave you your temples only. is that great? <laughs> the early church had penetrated society from top to bottom. We leave you your temples only. Christians, salt and light in the city. I love the stories of Africa. There's so many of them. But there are some tragic ones, too. Between 250 and 258, Decius and Valerian were the Roman empires. And coming up upon the thousandth anniversary of the Roman Empire, they began to hear speeches in the Senate of hate. Rome has lost its power. Someone is to blame. It must be the Christians. And they retaliated with enormous persecutions in those years. Christians were the target of the most brutal of the persecutions. Not surprisingly, in the midst of the persecutions, some Christians denied their faith under pressure. And when the persecution was over, Cyprian who preached about forgiveness, reminded the people that all God's earliest apostles, including Peter, the founder of the church, forsook Christ three times under pressure. Surely we must welcome these people back into our church and forgive them, the so-called lapsari, those who had lapsed in their faith. But there was a presbytery named Novation, and he said, no, you can't do that. That would deny the gift of martyrdom. It would introduce a double standard into the life of the church. We can't do that. And there in North Africa, the church split between what I will call the grace Christians and the truth Christians. And over a period of time, instead of evangelizing the lost and serving the poor, they began to cut each other down. And grace and truth Two sides of the coin in the New Testament became rival churches in the cities of North Africa. 
My contention after studying this for many years is not that Islam killed the church in the North African cities. It merely dusted off the spot where the church stood. And my friend, the photograph is important because it's happening all over again. Every city I know has a new battle between grace and truth churches. And Islam comes along in our wake. And that leads me to another photograph. A few years ago, I was in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and I said to a Muslim, a scholar, how is it that Hindu India, the whole subcontinent of, of Asia, is mostly the old Indian Empire? How is it that in India, which was Hindu, has Islamic bookends, Pakistan and Bangladesh? He said, you know, don't you? I said, no, not really. It's a serious question. How did that happen? He said, well, let me show you the map. And he took me up to the wall map, the large map, and he said, now notice Pakistan. Notice the Indus River runs all the way up through like the spine of the country and branches into five parts, up into the Punjab and other places. Then he said, notice West Bengal, where Calcutta is in Bengal, East Bengal, where Bangladesh is, the land of Bangla. Notice how the Brahmaputra and the Hooghly River squiggle their way through that country. He said, for centuries, the river peoples on both sides of India were looked down upon by Hinduism. They were scheduled caste, under caste, out caste peoples. The Hindus ignored and patronized those peoples. And then in the seventh century, Islam came not by imams and mullahs, but by little trading ships across the Persian Gulf, the Iranian Gulf. And up those rivers went lay people. And for the first time in Hindu history, the river people were being treated as human beings. And within a hundred years, they all decided to join the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, I counted 34 mosques in Chicago seven years ago. Last year, Diana Eck at Harvard, specialist in world religions, published a study pointing out that we had 73 mosques in Chicago. I give a mosque tour. Most of those mosques are located where evangelical churches used to be. What seems to be happening is that the very people that we are patronizing are reaching out for a brotherhood, not in the church, sadly. Do you think we could see a geographic shift in this country? Islamic cities, Christian suburbs. If you don't believe that, take a look at India one more time. Very interesting photograph. My next photograph comes in the album. It's not altogether happy, but it's, it's provocative. It's from Kenneth Scott Latterette, from the second of his seven volumes on the history of expansion of Christianity. He makes this observation. He says, you know, in the year 500, in the year 1500, Christianity didn't grow. There were about the same number of Christians in the world in 500 as 1500. About the same number of square miles under the influence of the gospel in 500 as 1500. What did he, what happened in that thousand years? Said Latterette, the church exchanged real estate for a thousand years. We gave up Africa and we gained Europe. If you look a little closer, you see even more what happened. We gave up African urban churches and we gave up European, we gained European rural churches. I've read a lot of books on church growth. I'm not sure the church is growing all that much. I think we may be exchanging real estate. I mean, churches may be growing in Orlando, but how many of them are coming from Miami? They may be growing in Colorado Springs, but how many of them are coming from Denver? They may be growing in, Los, in Seattle, but how many of them are coming from Los Angeles? Some people have mistaken the Lord's intervention for the church's migration, I'm afraid. But in fact, is the church really growing or are we merely exchanging real estate? Urban, suburban. It's a very important question. It comes from this photograph from Latterette. I have another photograph of a guy named Benedict of Nursia, little Italian place. Benedict was the sort of Bill Bright of the Middle Ages. He, uh, he, he was the founder of a certain kind of activistic monasticism. He took charismatic monks, but he added to them the genius of Roman organization. And he formed these marvelous lay communities 
One is a few blocks from my house in Chicago, Jesus People USA. It's very much like that, a community living and working, assimilating people in off the streets. And in the ambiguities of the Middle Ages, these were lay movements. Benedict organized lay people, and he organized the clock into four, six-hour shifts, and he disciplined the people with his rule, which is the simple little lay theology, sort of the four-law track of the Middle Ages. And with that, he sent them into the toughest neighborhoods of Europe, the Rhine, the Ruhr, the Po, and the Danube rivers, up on the mountains. And they taught economic development. They planted flax, they raised sheep, they grew the economy of the communities. They were self-funding. Most of those monasteries never had a preacher. These were lay ministries, and we need to take another look at those. I wonder what that would look like today if somebody said, let's organize the laity like that and send them into the armpits of America, into the worst sections of our country. It's happened before. Benedict did that. That's how Europe was converted. I have a lecture I give sometimes, a thousand years to make a Viking Baptist. That's my story. 834. Ansgar crossed the Baltic and started baptizing the Swedes. We had some of them for lunch, those missionaries. We worshiped the god of war. Then came the Catholics. Then came the Lutherans. Finally, in 1848, 1,014 years after Ansgar, the Baptists were born. Somebody had to come into the violent Viking culture and begin what these monks did. And I think as I look at that, some of us are going to have to look at a recovery of the Benedictine model for the most violent sections of our culture today. Another photograph, one of my favorites, comes from the 13th century. Genghis Khan was messing with most of Asia. Innocent III was a great and powerful pope. The English were organizing. It was a very important time in British law. But there was a man named Francis who was a playboy, and he had come to Christ, and he had learned to define theology as faith active in love. And he went to the Pope, and the Pope said, yes, my brother, organize your people, the poor people. And he did, and he went out and created the Franciscans to love people on the streets. In the same decade, Dominic, a Parisian, came to the same Pope and said, I have a vision. The theology is loving God with your mind probing the mysteries of the divine. I would like to start an order to teach theology and to penetrate the mysteries of God and, and to produce universities and an order of people who could preach the gospel to the people. The beauty of the Catholic Church is Francis and Dominic were kept together in the church, two sides of ministry in the city. Unfortunately for many today, they'd be two denominations. Folks, if you just had Francis, all too quickly the piety becomes moralism and the service becomes social work. And if you just have Dominic, the scholarship becomes scholasticism and irrelevant. And so we need to pull those two together, the Francis and the Dominic. Our Lord put it well. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. We need to pull Francis and Dominic back together in the CCDA movement. It's not either or, it's both and. I go over the incredibly terrible 14th century, I spend the whole course in pastoral care right there, what cities were doing. One third of Europe died in two years. Amazing ministries. 15th century, same. You, you know about the Reformation. Many photographs there, but let me just pick one. The Mennonites will enjoy this. George Blaurock which in German means blue coat. Maybe he only had one blue coat. So he called him blue coat. George Blaurock, standing in front of the Zurich City Council, they had ordered him banished from the city. He held up Psalm 24.1. The earth is the Lord's, it says. That surely includes Zurich. I will not be removed. You don't own the city. A theology of place. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> I love people who take the text that way. When the plain text makes common sense, seek no other sense. Huh? That's what he did. And the Mennonites were born, not in a rural area, by the way. They were born in the cities of Europe, in Zurich and other places. Well, Roger Williams, he convinced me to be an American Baptist. 
Roger Williams came to the colonies the same year as John Cotton in Boston, 1630. He went up to Salem, and all of a sudden he was very uncomfortable as he listened to the Puritans preach because they preached about Massachusetts as though it were the new Canaan. God has given me this plantation, said Winthrop in his sermon on the Arabella, and the other Puritans believed that, and they believed that they should exterminate any other people they found in the land. Well, when they looked around for Amalekites, who did they find? Narragansett Indians. Now, what are you supposed to do with Canaanites and Amalekites? Kill them? at worst and banish them at best. And so Puritan foreign policy was to get rid of those folks. Get them out into their Bantu stands, their reservations. Roger Williams protested, left the colony, wrote a 32 page book, The Difference Between Israel and All Other States. And while I re started reading him in college, I realized indigenous peoples is what he was about. He went over there to Providence, spent a year studying the Narragansett language, produced volume three of his seven volumes on the key to the language of America. I read it. He was a faithful Indian or Puritan trying to struggle with the fact that God didn't call Puritans to kill or banish Native Americans. And he founded the first of my churches there in 1639. We have an empty land theology. And developers don't give a rip about indigenous folks. On all six continents, it's happening one more time. Whether theologically or not, we are viewing indigenous peoples still as Amalekites and Canaanites to be banished from the land so that we can have it in our giant displacement theories. It's not fair. It's not biblical. It's not just. And this photograph of Williams was very important for me and my understanding of their church. They locked their paid pews and hired a guest lecturer to preach to them in the afternoons in the accustomed manner. Simeon, unable to use the locked pews of the church, went out. He was getting 49 English pounds a year. He went out and bought lumber and built benches for the aisle and the foyer. And every Sunday he came, found his benches in a heap and carried them in and set them up there. And he said, if half the people get double blessing, I'll be satisfied. And he stayed for 11 years. And then there was a reconciliation. The congregations got together and he stayed 54 years to be their pastor. But that's not all. He started the first seminary in his study over at the, over at the college. Five times he was dean. He was brilliant. He wrote books on theology, preached the gospel to the poor. Every one of his assistants he gave a missionary message to. He sent one of them... Um, Henry Martin off to India to translate the Urdu Bible. And then one day he heard that the prisons were going to be dumped on the Australians. And so he got the idea of appointing chaplains on the prison ships. Bishop Jack Reed told, John Reed told me in Sydney a few years ago that the Archdiocese of Sydney, Australia, 
is evangelical to this day because of Charles Simeon. Because those chaplains that Simeon chose to go on the boats were all evangelicals. And they preached the gospel all the way to Australia. And when those ships landed, most of those prisoners were converted and discipled on board ship. Isn't that incredible? And this guy had never seen an ocean, I think. But he had that kind of vision. And every single month, Charles Simeon went to London to a little borough called Clapham where he met with Pitt and Wilberforce and Hannah Moore, founder of Keswick, John Venn, and others. And guess what they did? They worked on getting rid of the slavery in the British Empire. It took them 50 years to get a bill, 1807 the first bill, 1837 the second bill, to get slavery banned in the British Empire. A handful of people meeting every week. I didn't grow up with a pastor. I didn't know what pastors did. I, when I was 23, I read that book about Simeon who was 23. I adopted him as my pastor. I like him so much, I named my dog Simeon. <laughs> if you come to my house, you'll meet Simeon. I either have a high view of dogs or a low view of preachers, someone says. <laughs> But Simeon taught me you could put all that together. You could, you could, you could work with poor people with integrity. You could, you could challenge systems. You could disciple preachers. You could love the university and knowledge. You could write books. You could love the poor, and you could work for justice, all in a pastor. September, don't turn the lights back on. We'll just go with the sound. <laughs> September 21, 1889. Jane and Julia are walking through the urban slums of Chicago. They'd graduated from Rockford Women's Seminary majoring in Greek, classical and biblical. They inherited a lot of money. They didn't know what to do. They saw an old house in the slum. They bought it. Jane moved into the second floor. Two weeks later, a burglar was crawling through her window, robbing her things. She was terrified, but she faked sleep. And when the burglar had filled his bag with her things and was about to climb out the window, she said, why don't you use the stairs? You might get hurt. <laughs> and the burglar was so distraught, he sat on the bed and cried. And he said, I don't want to rob people, but I got to support my family. And Jane Adams went out the next day and founded a garbage collection agency to hire this man and other men like him. And that's how the Jane Adams social work ministry began. Eventually, she used her Greek by organizing the first Greek theater on the streets of America that actually used original Greeks as actors. And because they had been so put down and patronized by Turks for over a hundred years, the Greeks in Chicago didn't know what they, they didn't know they were Greek. Jane Adams taught Greek to Greek immigrants in the slums of Chicago a hundred years ago as part of human development and community development. It's a wonderful photograph. 19, 1890. Livingston and Stanley, remember them? the great Victorian African missionaries? Well, Stanley wrote a book. It was magnificent. Two volumes. Big, wonderful book. It was the picture book for missions. In darkest Africa, the way in. And it was part of that Victorian white man's burden to go save Africa. William Booth had invented the Salvation Army in 1865. He read that book and saw what was happening. And so he produced In Darkest England, the way out. And the Salvation Army has republished that in this decade, and you really ought to read it. Because these two books, which talk about the end run of missions to the jungles, while avoiding the cities at home, is still happening. Still happening. And Booth was responding to it a hundred years ago. Very important photograph. I haven't time to tell you about the Evangelical United Front in New York, 181 to 1837. Charles Foster's dissertation, Errand of Mercy, is about that. Wonderful street ministries, incredible stuff. Many, probably 40 organizations popped up in the city streets. 
You could read Timothy Smith's Revivalism and Social Reform about 1830 to 1860. You read about Moody in the prayer meetings of the city and prayer for the city in 1858 in the marketplace of New York, spread all over the country. You could read Norris Magnuson's Salvation in the Slums. You could read the Rauschenbusch stories and the photographs from Hell's Kitchen. That's all part of our story. We're following in those footprints. Then I think of people like Dorothy Day. She grew up in Chicago, went to Episcopal Church, University of Illinois, studied philosophy and literature, brilliant woman, but she couldn't find any love in her church for the working poor. But she found it in the union organizers, and she became a union organizer and a communist sympathizer. I've just been rereading her biography and other books about her. And I'm very impressed again, and that's why I share this photograph. She may not be as well known as some of the others. In the 20s, she moved far away from God for a time and the church. She lived near Coney Island, southeast section of Manhattan. And, uh, but she couldn't get away. She, f she couldn't get away from the Lord. And she found her way to a little Catholic church and she fell in love with Christ one more time. And, and she began to read the gospel and see his love for the poor. And out of that, Dorothy Day formed the Catholic, Catholic worker movement. And she brought her unmarried, as she was, her daughter to the church and committed her life to serve the working poor. I look at this photograph and I say, we've done pretty good in the slums. What's happening today is the class gap is widening. As we shift from manufacturing to service economy, I've seen it in New York and elsewhere. The sweatshops are coming back big time. And I wonder if the Dorothy days of today are going to grow up in our churches and see that God is unconcerned with the working poor. God is defined in success terms and wealth terms, as you've heard already from Jim earlier this day. So this is a very important photograph for me. Well, there are many, many other photographs that I would share, but the time is, has come to stop. The Urban Album. If you invite me back in 25 years, I'll talk about Teresa of Calcutta and Jember Tefera of Addis Ababa. I'll tell you about the way that Floyd Flake, whose community development budget alone in New York City this year is bigger than Willow Creek's entire budget. I'll tell you about how Floyd Flake and Roderick Caesar and Susan Johnson and Preston Washington with the Harlem Coalition are rebuilding New York. If you invite me back in 25 years, I'll tell you about the people in Atlanta who are rebuilding Summerhill, and Wayne Gordon and Mary Nelsons of Chicago, and, and the Luptons and Martin Kings of Atlanta. And I'll tell you about Perkins of Mendenhall and Jackson and Pasadena and everywhere else he went. Uh, you invite me back in 25 years, I'll share these photographs. You see, I don't know if you really know what you're doing here. And maybe some of you think you're very insignificant, and you probably are. First Peter 2.9 puts it something like this. You were nobody, but now you are somebody. You're the kingdom of God. I know who you are, too. You're the people who are adding the photographs in the Urban Family album, for which I give thanks to you. And so I say... To God be the glory, and to the saints be thanks. And to the Christian Community Development Association, be courage. And to the cities, be hope. God bless you.